Seton, coming to you from Seton Hall Campus Ministry. I'm your host, Matthew Pearson. Uh, today, as we continue our little journey on uh, Lent 2017, um, we're going to get into a very important aspect of Lent, which is confession. Um, confession is uh, also known as the Sacrament of Reconciliation. This is where we confess our sins to God, and sometimes, uh, well, through the priest specifically, and sometimes that is a uh, very... A hot button issue for why do Catholics have to confess to a priest? What is the purpose? Where did this come from? Is this biblical, etc.? So, um, as we get into this, we're going to be joined by Father Frederick Miller, the spiritual director at St. Andrew's Hall for uh, for the seminary here, also an adjunct professor at the Seton Hall School of Theology. Uh, got his doctorate at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. Also has uh, two books, The Grace of Ours and The Trial of Faith of St. Therese of Lisieux. So check those out on uh, Amazon.com. Father Miller, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Matt. So, you're a priest. Why do I have to confess to you? What's the purpose of this? Well... Why can't I go straight to God? Well, you can, and you should, every day. We do that every day at Mass, and um, every night before we go to bed, we should tell God we're sorry for the sins of the day. But why you need to go to the confession to a priest is because you belong to a church. Ah, so that's, that's, the, that's the distinction. Well, you belong to a church, and more importantly, or related to that, you belong to Jesus Christ, that he claimed you as his own in your baptism. So on Holy Saturday night, Easter Vigil, lots and lots of people across the country and the world will be baptized. Many of them will be adults. Yeah, just and, a couple weeks here. And many of them will have committed very serious sins may have committed murder, may have committed adultery, fornication, drug abuse, whatever. Sure. Um, they, don't have, they don't have to tell confession. They don't have to confess because they're washed clean in the blood of Christ through the baptism. But once they're, they belong to Christ and Christ possesses them through grace, sure. then the sins that they commit after baptism are more serious than the sins committed before baptism because they're hurting the body of Christ Jesus himself and his body, which is, is the church. So once we're baptized, then the church tells us with the authority of Christ that all serious sins committed after baptism must be confessed to the priest so that the sinner could be reconciled to the church and through that reconciliation with the church reconciled to God in Christ. So specifically, where, where do we find this biblically? I mean... This is something obviously the church teaches, but it's it's often met with. Well, where do you find that in the Bible? Where, first of all, the understanding of the church as something other. Maybe we should start there. Maybe that's a better thing to start with. What what's the difference between the church, the Catholic Church, with priests, bishops, etc., versus I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe Jesus, is my Lord and Savior. That church. What, what, what are the things we need to pull out of that? When I say I believe in Jesus Christ, that act of faith does not come to as radical a point as it needs to come to unless I say I believe in Jesus Christ truly present in the Eucharist. That's why when the priest consecrates the bread and wine at Mass, what does he say after the consecration? The mystery of faith. This is the mystery of faith. And my faith in Jesus Christ terminates in my adoration of him in the Eucharist and my reception of his body and blood in the Eucharist. And if I do anything that would make me unworthy of that contact with Jesus in the Eucharist, then I need to bring that to confession. So confession is, for those who commit serious sin, mortal sin, confession is the door back to the Eucharistic communion. So, so in totality, baptism, because confession is just a, a reaffirming of your baptismal promises of your baptismal purity, correct? It's the restoration. Restoration. Okay. Mm -hmm. So baptism, confession if needed, and then those are means to an end, which is communion with Christ in the Eucharist, Absolutely. correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So specifically, now let's go, we've established that. Let's go to the, the biblical element. Okay. Well, just this past Sunday, um, one of the most beautiful readings of the liturgical year, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And... Um, Jesus confesses her sins for her. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of it that way. She yeah. says, let me get my husband. She says, he says, you, you, don't, you have had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not your husband. And then 
wow, she's overwhelmed. We don't know. They, we don't know. Sometimes there, there was more to the conversations that are, than that's recorded in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously no one was there to witness it. Right. You know, they just came at the end. But then when she went and she evangelized the people of her village and brought them to Jesus, she said, he told me everything I ever did. <laughs> so that's what confession is. Confession is Jesus. He's the one who, when in our relationship with him, he tells us what we've done that offends him and that hurts his church. And then we bring it to him in the sacrament of reconciliation. The beautiful passage, uh, it's one of my favorites, is when it's in Capernaum, Capernaum. Jesus is teaching there are so many people around that they can't get this poor paralytic to him. So his friends climb up on the roof, they take the thatch off the roof, and they row, lower the stretcher right at the feet of Jesus. Jesus looks at the guy and he says, your sins are forgiven. Obviously, that was the bigger problem than the paralysis. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously that's what Jesus took care of first. And there's, I mean, there's truth to that. I mean, even, even uh, modern day psychology is beginning to understand that there's a direct connection between bodily issues and guilt mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, being plagued by, you know, bad things you've done. You know, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, let's, speaking of, you know, the, he told me everything I ever knew or I ever did. Um, this is something we ask the Holy Spirit for. This, the grace to, uh, of contrition, to, to understand what we've done wrong, how it's offended God. Obviously, we have the laws of God, the commandments. But I think a very sticky point that needs to be clarified is conscience. Number one, what is it in regards to why you need it for confession? And where do you get a properly formed conscience? Well, conscience is the voice of God within us. Cardinal... John Henry Newman believed that conscience was one of the most, the most maybe compelling proofs for the existence of God. That we know, that everyone knows that it would be wrong to strike your parent. You know, everyone knows that it would be wrong to kill somebody in cold blood. Everyone knows that it would be, you know, terrible to steal $5 from a desperately poor person. So conscience, unless it's been deadened, yeah. exting almost extinguished, even then, there's still in everyone a glimmer of this inner voice indicating good and evil. Um, the church, one of the main functions of the church is to proclaim the truth, the moral truth. And so the church f helps us to form our consciences so that we're not accusing ourselves of things that really aren't evil, or we're not overlooking things that are evil in our lives. That's a good way to put it, because I know most people get hung up on the other side of, you know, the church is telling me exactly what I uh, am doing wrong, when in real, well, that's actually also tells you the things that you don't need to worry about. This is called scrupulosity. Um, okay, so I've gone to confession, I walked out, you know, I was absolved. Um, what, what are the effects of, I mean, we briefly touch, it, it returns you to, you know, it, uh, to your baptismal purity, but practically in someone's, you know, growing in the faith, someone's practice of the faith, what, what is regular confession, even for venial sin, even if they're not in a state of mortal sin, even for venial sin, what, uh, what kind of effects is this going to have on the spiritual life? Well, the first effect is that the sins that you confessed are forgiven. So the first effect of absolution is the forgiveness of sin, and that, if necessary, it involves reconciliation with God and with the church. Um, venial sin doesn't break our connection with God and the church. Mortal sin does. So but the, either whether we confess mortal sin or venial sin or a combination of both, the sins are forgiven. And also God pledges to give us the graces that we need to overcome those sins in the future. So there's a strengthening of the person, of the soul, uh, especially in regard to the sins that were confessed in the confession and forgiven in the confession. Um, just in 30 seconds we got left, what's, what's the one thing you th say someone hasn't been to confession in quite a while, college student, someone, you know, been away from the church for 30 years. What's the, what, uh, what do you think the biggest mistake that people make when they go to confession or the biggest uh, kind of myth that they might believe in? Well, I think the, the thing that holds people back from going to confession is that they really are afraid to be totally honest. And so I think the best advice to give to someone when he or she goes to confession is 
you're talking directly to God. Uh, the priest can never say anything that you've confessed. So just be as honest and blunt as possible and open your heart to receive the mercy of God. Excellent. Father Fred Miller um, also has a, uh, a little pamphlet um, here at Seton Hall University in the Immaculate Conception Chapel um, with a much more, you know, walk you through the Ten Commandments, you know, examine your conscience so you can really understand um, the best things to uh, to confess to the priest so you can really understand, you know, where what sins you've committed and how you've committed them, number, form, etc. It's very it's very thorough, but it's not uh, it's not draining. Um, Do you have one thing you want to read yet? I do. Um, We believe that Jesus instituted the sacrament of penance on Easter night. Uh, And as a matter of fact, the church at the Council of Trent solemnly defined that this is when Christ primarily instituted, principally instituted. Mm -hmm. So let me just read the passage in conclusion. This is John 20, beginning with verse 19, going through verse 23. On the evening of that, f- of that day, the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had showed, said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were re- glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. At that moment, Jesus gave the apostles and all those who would succeed them his power to forgive all human sin in the church. And what a great gift this is. It's a a gift which is... um, We don't appreciate appreciate it enough. And this, this Lent would be a good time to for those who have lost the practice of confession or not taken it seriously to to turn back to the Lord yeah. through this wonderful sacrament. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, Yeah, now is the time. The church calls us to during this Lent season. Um, well, Father, you want to give us a blessing also to end? The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.